Hi, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Um, some of you um, already know me. I'm, the, um, I'm Mike Slott. I'm the editor of the Secular Buddhist Network uh, website, and I'm really pleased to uh, be able, uh, on behalf of the website, to co-sponsor this launch with Ufari, which is the, um, the organization which is the publisher of Witten, Witten's new book, Revamp, uh, Writings on Secular Buddhism. Okay, if you haven't seen a copy of the book, there it is. And of course, encouragements to, to buy it. I sent an uh, email that reminder that uh, was sent out about seven o'clock or about an hour before the, uh, the event has some information on how to purchase the book on Tufer's uh, online store. And also, if you donate um, $15 or more or $5 per month to um, the Secular Network, you get a free copy of the book. So uh, I would encourage you to do that. So we're going to meet uh, here on Zoom for about an hour. Uh, I'm going to just give a very brief intro um, of Winton, for those of you not that familiar with him. And then I'll be asking him some questions that will touch on, I think, topics of the book. And then um, we'll have um, maybe 15, 20 minutes for you to ask questions of Winton. And uh, when we get to that point, you can just type into the chat section your question. I'll read it and uh, we will answer. And I just want to say now that if you were not able to get all, to all the questions, I will give you um, uh, the email address um, from the Secular Buddhist Network, and you can actually send me those questions, and I'll pass them on to Winton, and um, we'll we can get out a response to everybody um, who was here. So um, a brief intro first. Um, Winton has been a Dharma practitioner uh, in Australia since 1987, teacher of insight meditation since 1995. He's a senior teacher um, for the Sydney Insight Meditators, and through his many articles, through his Dharma talks, and several books, Winton has contributed tremendously to the development of Buddhism. Now, aside from meditation and Buddhism, Witten is also a scholar and writer in social democratic theory and practice, especially the Swedish experience from 1928 to 1976, and also in genocide studies uh, with a special reference to the Holocaust. He has also written two historical novels, Rule of Law and Love, Death, Chariot of Fire, that were published in 2016 and 2020, respect. So um, quite a wide range of interests and projects, and I'm actually amazed. <laughs> um, and now you have this new book revamped. Uh, and I, let me just say uh, that I, I've read the book. I was extremely impressed by the breadth and depth uh, of the book, which is a collected essays uh, on the topic of secular Buddhism, but you covered so many different areas and so insightfully, you deal with the history of Sikh Buddhism, its core ideas, uh, the relationship between secular Buddhism and traditional forms of Buddhism, um, the, the connection between secular Dharma and certain Western philosophies and perspectives, um, how to approach meditation from a secular perspective, the role of sanghas, and then you um, we have a common interest in the, in, in the importance of uh, political engagement as part of the secular Dharma path, which I hope we'll talk a little bit about. So this is really a great book. Again, I encourage people to, to buy it and to, uh, to learn about, about secular Buddhism. So I'm going to start with some questions now and um, went in and uh, give you an opportunity to you know, kind of explore some of these issues. So I'm actually curious to know, because I, I don't know about your own personal history in terms of how you actually got involved um, in meditation and Buddhism. You know, uh, you were obviously you've been in the academic world, studying politics, 
genocide studies and so forth. So how did you actually get involved in meditation? And was this in any way related to the other projects that you've been working on? Let's start with that. Uh, well, I actually, my first introduction to Buddhism came when my blood pressure began to creep up and I was being threatened with medication. I thought, I'll learn to meditate and deal with it that way. And I just happened by, just by happenstance, uh, logged in on a Buddhist group who were teaching an introduction to meditation. And the meditation uh, worked. And but being an academic, I wasn't satisfied with that. I needed to know why it worked. And so um, they said, well, we've got a, a, another course starting on Buddhism. So that's how it started. I had no interest in, you know, looking for a, a spiritual path. But once um, I got, I got a, a whiff of the Dharma, I, I, it was a profound it was a it was a profound conversion of experience, and basically I've never looked back from that. Uh, but where I started was in um, a category of um, Buddhism called Buddhist modernism, a, an expression um, that has been very well analysed by David McMahon in his book on the making of. Buddhist modernism. And essentially, this is the sort of um, Buddhism that we in, normally encounter in the West, I guess. It's ancestral Buddhism uh, with a modern face. Um, you know, it's, in, it, it's presented in our languages rather than Sanskrit or Pali, and it's, um, uh, and it, you know, it, and it's open to lay practitioners uh, and runs retreats uh, and that sort of thing and gives training in what are essentially, uh, by origin, monastic forms of meditation. Um, so uh, in 1995, when I became much more interested in, or particularly interested in insight meditation, um, that's when I, uh, th that's of course where my serious entry point into Dharma practice began. And um, it was also where I began to see uh, the cracks and, and um, uh, inco incoherences in Buddhist modernism itself. Uh, that while it, while it appeared to be modern and had some extraordinarily articulate teachers, um, many of them American, of course, like Joseph Goldstein. Um, there was still there was still this mismatch between that and uh, the the world of organised Buddhism, which was um, mainly monastic. There was no, it remained an enormous deference towards um, monasticism and monastics themselves, uh, and also um, the fact that the that the kind of meditation practices they were teaching did not come from the Buddha, from the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, but rather from the Abhidharma, which was, um, the, you know, the beginning of the re really serious religification of the Buddha's tradition after his death. So um, yeah, these sort of incoherences began to worry me. And um, and, after, and um, then something happened in, particularly in Sydney, where, where I was practicing, that two of the institutions that we relied on for uh, retreat facilities uh, and, and meetings of, uh, in, with, in the city itself uh, imploded. And we suddenly, the people, my, my with Dharma friends and I suddenly found ourselves out in the cold. Um, and this was a disaster at the time, but it in hindsight was a blessing because it meant that we could reinvent our institutions from the ground up. And um, so that uh, it, just before that, 
we'd had a visit from Stephen and Martine Bachelor and who'd run retreats and given talks. So we were kind of prepared for the disaster that came the following year to have a creative, uh, creative response to it. So that was the origin of Sydney Insight Meditators. Um, and um, then uh, the different sanghas that that operate under its um, um, under uh, under its umbrella began to turn more and more in a secular direction, until uh, about four years ago we we set up the very first uh, explicitly secular Buddhist sangha here in Sydney. So that's that was my. Um, roughly my journey. <laughs> right. I mean, at what point did, did you actually think of yourself as a, as a secular Buddhist? You know, a lot of us, you know, started in insight meditation, as Zen lineages, and some of us, you know, some people who are interested in secular Buddhism still practice the Zen Buddhist hmm. in insight. So I'm just kind of curious that was it at the point where you actually formed the Sydney Insight Meditators that you kind of self-identified as a secular Buddhist or like what was the, or do you remember a specific point at which you said, no, I think I'm a secular Buddhist now? Well, I, um, we, we certainly saw, our, I mean, the, the, the initial step was to call ourselves lay Buddhist groups, which meant that we dissociated from the uh, monastic hierarchies and the whole conception of monastic authority, of mm -hmm. writing monastic authority. So it was really when um, I think Stephen and Martin came back in 2010, and for the first time we heard that expression, secular Buddhism, which I think even they were handling, uh, you know, a bit like a hot potato at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, it rapidly, the, the potato rapidly cooled and could be seized uh, quite robustly. And for, I think it was from that point that the idea that we were secular Buddhists arose. I mean, it didn't mean we, uh, it arose in any kind of um, sectarian way. We were still involved in, you know, in practice communities, which in, which were still Buddhist modernist and in some cases even ancestral. Um, so that, it was it was sort of a different story with uh, Zen. I mean, I've never been part of a Zen group or or practiced over time with a Zen group, but a lot of my Dharma friends were Zenies, and um, they didn't have so much of a problem that we had both us post Theravadans, we might say. Um, because, um, you know, Zen has already baked into it a radically critical spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also got a practice of shikantaza in just sitting, which is very close to the kind of uh, meditation practice we were moving to ourselves. Uh, to a great extent, um, inspired in, in those days by Jason Siff, who kept making annual visits to the east coast of Australia and running retreats and so forth. Yeah, so actually let's focus a little bit now on, on meditation. And you've written some, I think, pretty interesting articles about the, the need to move away from what you describe as a kind of formulaic vision of meditation as moving with specifics and an ultimate goal. And you're, you're urging us to kind of think about meditation very different. Um, so talk about that a little bit more, because I think that also brings out the contrast between the secular mm -hmm. approach to um, the Dharma and more traditional versions, even in the, the modernist forms of insight meditation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, practices like the, like the Mahath, uh, Mah the, um, Practices coming out of Burma, and uh, particularly, I suppose, Burma, which focused on you know primary object, secondary object, etc. That you were supposed to do certain things and stay within certain bounds in your meditation practice. Now, you know, these practices were developed uh, to induct men into uh, 
celibate, renunciant, monastic life. And um, it started to occur to me, first of all, the importance of adopting a meditation practice, which is going to refract our whole life experience. I mean, I think this is what meditation is for, and this should be what it's about. But uh, to practice in the Mahasi tradition, for instance, uh, meant that a lot of um, what came up in sits um, for most of us who were uh, not celibate, not even men, and um, living quite complex and variegated lives, a lot of this, of course, didn't fit into uh, the primary object, secondary object kind of model, um, and therefore was treated by our mentors as not meditation and ended up on the cutting room floor. And I guess Jason Sipp's uh, contribution to this was saying, uh, was to challenge that and say everything that happens, every experience you have when you sit down and meditate is meditative experience. It's legit. This is what we're working with in the real world and, um, and therefore what we are also working in in a, in a distilled way with uh, in our meditation sittings. So this opened up the whole possibility of, at least for us post-Theravadans, of going for non-formulaic ways of meditating, in other words, being completely open to whatever arose. Mm. And, um, you know, for Zenis, this was not new <laughs> because they had their, uh, their just sitting practice, their just shikantazit practice. And as, um, you know, Barry McGee put it in his wonderful book, Ending the Pursuit of Happiness, um, was, um, the, uh, was the idea of inviting the mind to display its contents, display its whole contents. Uh, and that this is what we were working with. We were not trying to narrow our focus, but rather the energy, the commitment to the practice was uh, to, to stay focused on whatever was arising. And that seems to be the, um, you know, the basic message of the um, Satipatthana Sutta, which I often described as, a, as like a concept map you know, in, in the old days when there were paper maps, um, if you if you went hiking, you had a big sheet of paper which showed you the entire terrain you were going through. Um, and then uh, along came GPS and we got strip maps which just said you go here and then you go there and there were no reference points. You don't know really what you're doing. Um, so um, to me, what the, the Satipatthana Sutta does is present a, a concept map of all the experiences that we can have in meditation and a way of sorting them, a way of uh, labelling them and above all, a way of understanding them and understanding how we move through this broad terrain of our inner experience. Um, so let me, um, let me switch um, topics a little bit. Um, meditation and just have in the book uh, several chapters that look at sort of the um, um, affinity between the secular approach to the Dharma and certain Western perspectives um, and including pragmatism and phenomenology. You have a chapter on uh, Martin Heidegger, for example. Now, I know this. these are Really, those are, um, good good chapters. There, um, you make some really good connections, I think, be, between um, the secular dharma and these Western philosophies. And for a group that is, you know, you know, not necessarily um, um, sort of well versed in sort of Western philosophy, can you kind of describe for us, you know, what are some of the more um, Western thinkers, um, where you see this connection, and and why they're important for us to um, to, to learn about. Yeah, 
Well, it's a big question, I'll, I'll, and I'll try to um, uh, give relatively short answers in each case. <laughs> but um, if, if you, Western philosophy took a, um, and a lot of Western thinking, not just philosophy, but uh, novel writing and so on, took a huge turn after the death of God, as um, Nietzsche described it in 1882, I think. Um, what he was referring to, of course, was he wasn't arguing for atheism, but he was saying people have stopped referring back to God as, uh, you know, the ultimate boss. Um, and um, now we've lost our traditional ways of see seeking meaning in our lives. Um, and a lot of people found that a, a, a good, a, you know, a creative challenge to think, well, what what is meaningful? And one of the um, one of the responses was phenomenology. The uh, the the portal figure here is Martin Heidegger, who wrote an extremely difficult book, which I will try and uh, summarise in about one minute, uh, called um, "Being and Time." And the point that um, uh, Heidegger is making there is that our lives and ourselves are always in process. Uh, and, he, and he avoided talking about the human being as a separate, a separate and enduring entity. He talked about the human being in terms of process, being here, in other words, being present, being present right now in this place, uh, and being in the world, which was almost the same thing, that we are in constant interaction with what's around us and the people who are around us. Uh, and this means that there, you know, we ourselves uh, have, we're not in sort of like um, ships sailing through this, we are part of it. And this is how we have to see ourselves as being there, being in time, being with others, being towards death. Because, you know, in order to live authentically, we have to be consciously aware of our mortality. Um, now, this idea of, um, of being always in process lines up very nicely with the Buddha's uh, uh, term anatta, meaning not self. So, you know, if you've been, if you've done a 10 day insight meditation retreat, you know, a good intensive one, you you have noticed a whole lot of process of things arising and passing away the whole time. But at the end, the end, there's something missing. And the, what's missing is the hero of the story or the choreographer or the author of the story. There's no, it doesn't refer to a particular person. It's, it's impersonal, as they often say. And this seems to me to line up perfectly with what uh, Heidegger is saying and essentially what the message of phenomenology is. Um, to go to, um, uh, to pragmatism, which is a, essentially a, an American school, uh, but it has a lot of, um, it has, has a lot of common starting points with uh, European continental philosophy like um, uh, like phenomenology and existentialism, and the one of the start and it, you know the, this school begins with John Dewey and um, William James, brother of the famous Henry James, uh, and goes right down to our own time with Richard Rorty, and um, one of the points they have in common with all post Nietzschean thought is that is to challenge the idea of ultimate truth. That basically, for the pragmatists, the what is true is what uh, what promotes human well-being right now. So you know, uh, for a long time, belief in God was a good idea because um, it helped people. It helped people lead you know ethical lives, and it helped people to come together in communities. But in the modern world. Uh, God is a metaphor that has reached its use by date. It either has to be abandoned or it has to be repurposed. And there are a lot of interesting Christian theologians who tried to repurpose it. 
Um, so um, that's a, that that seems to um, cha you know change a lot of our basic thinking about you know who we are and what what we're doing in the world. But another point that it seems to me absolutely vital in understanding the difference between conventional Buddhism and secular Buddhism is a point made by Richard Rorty about uh, two contrasting, diverging approaches to spiritual life. Uh, one um, is what he calls self-purification. Uh, this is where one is concentrating on one thing. Uh, one is um, uh, such as being a good monastic or you know being a good puritan or whatever it is and you and you discard everything else you strip it away you know you become a skeleton moving through space um, with values like um, renunciation and detachment to the four as against that is what he calls um the the path of self-enlargement nothing to do uh, with narcissism but the but self-enlargement is where you're exploring all human possibilities um, including you know having children being being politically active um, being whatever you know whatever seems important to us throughout our lives and really going for it so this as so, and following our curiosity, following our talents and our curiosity to the ultimate and this is a this is a point that uh, this is an idea that Rorty has taken from Sigmund Freud actually um, so these seem to me to be two very contrasting uh, models of spirituality which um, which it, you know, I think goes to the core of the argument between conventional Buddhism based on monasticism as opposed to uh, secular, the secular Buddhism, which is much more in the self-enlargement category that Richard Rorty talks about. Um, so uh, th those are two important schools. And, I, and since I've mentioned Freud, I think Freud is terribly important in unlocking what's actually going on in the Buddha's first discourse uh, on the task of embracing and fully knowing the difficult aspects of our lives. Uh, particularly Freud's essay on um, mourning and melancholia, when he talks about the what he calls the unpleasant work of grieving. Uh, if someone really close to you dies, for instance, um, you go into mourning. This was well understood before the First World War, actually, in our kind of social knowledge in the West, and we've lost it with um, by being confronted by mass death in the two world wars. Um, and um, so we've neglected, we've trivialised this grieving, which really aligns with what the Buddha meant in the first task of embracing and fully knowing dukkha. It's only by doing that uh, that we emerge out the other side as um, as much deeper and more spacious and wiser and compassionate human beings. So there are three. I better stop there before we go no, it's, <laughs> any further. <laughs> yeah. Certainly a very, very big topic and a lot more could be said, but thank you for that. So there I just one other person that I do and um has some very important thing that are relevant. Secular Buddhist is Martin Hagman. Uh, just came out with a book in 2020 called Light. And um, particularly his notion of secular faith. So um, could you um, talk a little bit about that? Why you think that, that this book and, and Hagman is saying is to secular faith? Yes, well, uh, Martin Heglund's uh, book came out last year, or at least came out in paperback last year, and its full title is This Life, colon, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom. 
And, and in a way, they're the three key concepts in his book. He's not a Buddhist, uh, but what he says is of peculiar relevance, it seems to me, to secular Buddhism. What is meant, first of all, with this life, he's talking about this life as the only life we have. We, and, it, and it forces, um, you know, Buddhist modernists um, of, of the Western variety to, conf, to stop sitting on the fence about rebirth. Um, this life ends with death and death is final. This is the basic premise that, is, um, that his argument rests on. So this is the only life we're going to have. We, we, uh, and we obviously want to pack it with meaning. And it's not only that we, are, that we have finite lives, we are also uh, vulnerable. Uh, everything in our lives, people who are closest to us, our closest relationships, our dearest um, ideals and projects are all at risk. They're all at stake. And so um, we need to give them the, the, our ultimate loyalty. Uh, this is, should be our ultimate concern, is to how to live this life in a meaningful way, because there is no other life. <laughs> and um, so it's... Um, uh, with secular faith, secular faith, if you unpack that term, secular is essentially pointing to the fact that our lives unfold in this time and in this place. And uh, so whatever matters to us has to be of the same order as that. Everything is at risk. Everything is at stake. That's why we care about it. And care is, of course, the basic the, the, the underlying ethic of the Dharma. So, uh, so what we are committing to what is mortal in our own lives. You can find this beautifully expressed um, in, in uh, quite a few uh, you know, poetic forms. But um, that's, if, we, if, we're following, if we're following our secular faith, uh, then we are also uh, we are also exercising a vital freedom of choosing um, our uh, fundamental orientations and how we honour them in the way we live our lives, in the way we practice. And the contrast here is between uh, between religious faith and secular faith. Now, religious faith is about uh, faith in things that are not of this world and are timeless. So conceptions of um, God, of um, an, an eternal, uh, a, a, an eternal heaven, or something like that. If we have faith in those, if we put our faith in those sorts of things, then we are denigrating the lives that we are living now. We are being faithless towards the lives we're actually living. And by the way, uh, talking about poetic expressions of this, um, Mary Oliver's wonderful poem, which is essentially a poem about grieving um, in Blackwater Woods, right at you know, the last five or six lines is a perfect expression of what secular faith involves. I discovered that, not Martin Heglund. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why it seems to me he's, uh, he's very important. And um, then uh, towards the end of his book, he goes into a, a sort of political mode, which I found also uh, very appealing. Thank you, Witten. No, we're, um, we have about 25 minutes left of the hour. And I have a few more questions, but I, I want the folks um, on, this, on this call to be able to ask you some questions as well. So I'm just going to ask you one more question, which follows from what you've just been talking about, which is that Hagelin does, uh, he makes the argument that um, to, to, to the kind of society that can really sustain um, a secular faith and where people have the opportunity to really make choices about what is meaningful to them is a democratic social society. Now, 
both you and I have a shared interest in social engagement and political activism. That's not true of um, you know, Buddhists from both traditional forms of Buddhism and also some secular Buddhists. Why do you think that um, secular Buddhists should be concerned about social and political issues? Why should we be um, engaged in that way? Well, the brutal answer to that is that if we are not involved in the two great crises of our world and our lives, uh, then uh, they'll probably kill us. And um, th so that, that's climate change and, uh, and the in rapidly intensifying social injustices on a global scale, on a national scale, right down to a suburban scale, um, that uh, neoliberal capitalism is uh, fostering. So um, I, I was actually on, um, on a... Um, massive demonstration in the city here last Friday, uh, one inspired by Greta Thunberg and um, involved, you know, the, the, the core of it was the school strike, the kid, school kids going on strike over um, massive passivity <laughs> around climate change. Uh, so, you know, us you know, grey headed people were marching with kids out of school and wearing school uniforms. Um, and um, one of the placards said, one of the kids placards said, you are going to die of old age, we are going to die of climate change. And it really made the point, this is an existential crisis. And as uh, Pope Francis, God bless him, argues in his wonderful encyclical called Laudato Si about climate change, you can't separate the issue of global warming from these intensifying social exclusions and social injustices. The two arise from the same source. And that is why uh, it's so important to tackle both. And neither of them can be tackled in terms, in neoliberal terms, because the forms of calculation in neoliberal Capitalism uh, completely ignore uh, problems of, um, of of global destruction and, um, and 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 breakdowns of society that they're involved. So uh, I guess that's the answer to that question. And I feel I can quote um, uh, papal authority <laughs> giving that answer. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, it's um, why don't we? Um, I was had suggested earlier that um, folks could uh, type in questions onto the chat, but we have, I think, a reasonable, reasonable enough people here that I think maybe just if if someone wants to ask a question, if they feel okay doing, just to raise their hand and I'll um, call them, and you should just ask your question directly to to Winton uh, about anything that you know we've been discussing or any question you might have about the, the book. So does anybody anybody have a, a question for Winton? I have a couple more if, if, uh, if you don't. So, oh, okay. Shannon, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hello, Winton and Mike. Thanks so much for hosting. I was wondering, Winton, if you can directly address why you wrote this book. You talked about your history a little bit, but I'm curious, why did you choose to write this? Why now? Thank you. Uh, well, the answer is simple because um, Ramsey Margolis there on the screen told me to write it. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> uh, it, it was not, not ab initio, but um, because I'd you know, written quite a few Dharma talks and I'd had a couple of long essays published in uh, the online journal of global Buddhism. And so it, you know, it was time to maybe throw them all together between the same covers. Um, and when I started pulling you know, selection out, um, I, th I thought I detected a discursive arc. <laughs> so it was going from A to B. And um, so I rearranged them in in a way that would 
try and bring this sort of progressive element out that you know one argument led to another argument to another uh, and so I think I've managed to produce a book uh, that takes uh, that takes the reader through uh, the, the the big issues in secular Buddhism in a in a kind of rational progression and that's what I've uh, that's what I've tried to do thank you and thanks thank Ramsey <laughs> Thank you, Shannon, for asking the question. Any, any other, um, anybody else have a, a question to raise? Um, you know, I, um, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit, um, talk a little bit about the, what your, what your sense is of uh, the direction we need to go in terms of building sanghas. It's something that uh, Stephen Batchelor has He's talked about um, this issue, but hasn't really gotten much into the details of it. And um, maybe if you could give us your own experiences in Sydney with uh, Sydney Insight Meditation, if that's a, perhaps a bit of a model for the direction we should be going. But I think that's something that uh, you know, people who are interested in secular Buddhism, trying to figure out what, you know, what does that actually mean? How, how you know, what should be the role of Angas or community of practitioners? What should be, how should they be structured differently? You know, how should they coordinate with each other? So I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, I hope that's a question for other people. Interesting as well. Yeah, I, I think it's important to understand what community actually means. It's not a collection of individuals. It's a process, the process of, um, of interaction of individuals who are pursuing uh, a common pursuit. And um, it's interesting actually that that was Hegel's conception of God, that God was the relationship between us. <laughs> um, but it, it, so um, a Sangha is precisely this sort of community, which is about the interactions within it that help us to, to uh, practice the Dharma. And um, I, th I think um, uh, once you get that once you get that concept in, then you work out what what sort of relationships do we want with each other, and not only those who are actually with us now, but those who might want to come in. Uh, and um, in this way, we you know in West in Western society, we've got the model right there you know if you if you've ever been active in a stamp collecting club or a, or a um, you know basketball club uh, or you've been a member of the branch of a political party or a local progress association uh, any number of civil society groups they all follow the same pattern and I think this is the pattern uh, that um, that a that a sangha starting from scratch should pursue. You know, everyone is an equal member. Uh, there are no exclusions based on race, gender, or any other ascribed difference. Um, and uh, there are annual elections, and people who've got executive functions or go on the or go on a committee are re-elected every year. Uh, or renewed every every year, and um, you know it's in, and it's a, an ideal speech situation, as they say in German philosophy. You know, it, everyone speaks freely uh, and as an equal, and without restraint or constraints. You know, there are no um, boss cockies to please. There are no uh, there are no members who are claiming some sort of charismatic authority because they're members of some lineage or they you know they're getting around in sheets or something like that um, that that seems to me to be the model of of a sangha uh, also interestingly with uh, sim we we started sydney insight meditators during that great crisis here in sydney in 2015 in the uh, buddhist modernist world um, and um, 
and it it's just a peak organization you know it's um it, because all the little sangas didn't have uh, enough money or resources to run proper residential retreats we pooled our resources into sim which did you know did the big stuff for us but in no way interfered with how the internal developmental project uh, process of any of the sangas that it represented so um it, it was in this way that uh that the Sangha that I'm a member of, uh, charmingly called Kookaburra Sangha after those loudly laughing birds, so we didn't take, <laughs> take ourselves too seriously. Um, and, um, and that is, the, there we have, it's, you know, it's not big enough for us to worry about forming a committee, but everything is dealt with um, in open session, in open forum. And this is where we discuss our practice, where we discuss where we want to go, what we want to study over the next 12 months in terms of sort of study. Uh, and, uh, and there are no teachers. So while I'm a teacher to various sanghas, I'm not a teacher to my own. There's a, there's a biblical idea here. One is never a prophet in one's own land. <laughs> And um, so, um, so that's that's simply how it's worked. I mean, I think, you know, the way that Western civil society works when we want to form our stamp collecting club or something like that. That's um, that, that's where you start. Uh, where Stang Sanger Life starts. It doesn't start with, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, serenity in some other country who's the source of all wisdom and. Mm -hmm. Charismatic authority. <clears throat> uh, Sharon, go ahead. So uh, I'm moving from the um, more general, um, you know, sangha related and um, concept related to the particular. I'm curious about um, how your particular your individual practice has evolved and whether, um, you know, whether the, uh, the so-called label of being a secular Buddhist has, has changed anything in your practice or, or if not, if you, you know, you don't have to address that particular question, but I'm wondering uh, how, uh, if it has, how your, um, your individual practice has evolved. Uh, well, it certainly um, evolved along the non-formulaic um, insight practice that I was talking about before, and um, which has made made it, you know, clear to me that how important process is. That the first of all, the process of registering recognition of what is happening in my meditation practice. Uh, is and and understanding what awakening means. You know, we have <clears throat> that's an, another point of, of difference uh, between you know, conventional Buddhism and secular Buddhism is that awakening is a process, and it's a process that you know, that that one can intensify through skillful meditation practice. And, but it has nothing to do with achieving a status of full enlightenment or full awakening or uh, final knowledge or any of that sort of stuff. It's not goal oriented in that way. It's much more about, you know, what am I learning from this moment? And I might forget it in two hours time, you know, and um, and shout at the television screen when the prime minister comes on or something. But uh, it's um, it's uh, it, it's a it's a it's a process of gradual deepening of gaining greater spaciousness, of gaining greater equanimity, and um, you know all those all those classic perfections and that most unfortunate translation of the param paramis or paramitas. Uh, so it's it's transforming, but it's not tra it's transforming within this human model. I'm not after some sort of 
superhuman in point when I've gone beyond suffering, whatever that could possibly mean to someone living in a human body. Um, and, um, and and so these these different changing, uh, you know, the goalposts in this way is tremendously important to me personally. So um, I'm not trying to be something other than what I am, but I am trying to be and who I am, but rather being a much better version of who and what I am, rather than being, you know, uh, rather than levitating and doing magical things like that. <clears throat> there are no photographs of me levitating, even in my early days. So. <laughs> It's good to know that. Um, any other, um, anybody else have a, have a question? Yes, Heather, go ahead, you just need some. Just a little question. How many people went and in the Kookaburra Sangha? Uh, we're, we're still online, actually. We, we're going to go back to uh, meeting in the flesh next month, but online, we, we're now getting about 16 or 17 people regularly turning up. And um, it's a it's a bit of a problem for us because the people who've started uh, lobbying in on us, so they're terrific practitioners, but they're living, you know, um, a thousand kilometres away, <laughs> and and we're very much a local, yeah, you know, a local group. Uh, a lot of us walk or cycle to it or something like that, but um, uh, but that's that's about the size of it, and it seems to be about the right size for. So how many locals then? If you are you saying sixteen or seventeen locals, and then more visitors, or these days we're about uh, there seems to be about six, five or six non-locals. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's very tempting to go to some of these overseas ones when you can, you know. But I yeah. understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Heather. Any, anybody else have? Um... You know, uh, Winton, this is um, um, something I just thought about, you know, and you were talking about your own practice and um, kind of relationships within a sangha. Um, that, that you described the, the traditional 10-day um, insight meditation retreat. For those of us in the States, many of us have gone to Insight Meditation Society, Massachusetts, or Spirit Rock in California, those are the two, two for that. And uh, although, again, insight meditation is a kind of a modernized, westernized version, Theravada, medit uh, you know, the tradition, um, the, uh, the retreats are set up uh, kind of along the monastic model, in a sense. It's the idea that you're, you're there to kind of individually meditate and to develop concentration and insight to uh, take you forward. If you were, um, if we were all together as secular this and we were going to have a retreat, how would you, how would you, uh, how would you do it differently if you wanted to move away from kind of the monastic model of a retreat? If we were gonna to be together for 10 days to kind of really deepen our practice, how would you, uh, how would you imagine us doing that as a as secular? Well, I, I wouldn't abolish the evening meal to start with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Theravadan monastics don't eat after 12 noon. And this is what they thrust on lay practitioners who go to retreats in quasi-monastic mode. But that's not an entirely serious answer. I, I'd, um, the, the, one, the one thing that I would uh, retain is uh, silence. Because you know, and one of the um, parts of the book I'm dealing with is dealing with the defence of the inner life and the way that we are so distracted, um, particularly in the digital age, from uh, from our own inner experience and our own inner thoughts, and for that matter, uh, deeper relationships with each other. Uh, so I'd, I'd certainly keep the uh the silence going but i have periods of, i mean periods where um 
people could come together in small groups to you know, compare notes for a, a short period of time. But otherwise, uh, to keep it probably on that um, on that individual level, but also giving people the possibility of um, other forms of practice. One, one that I'm very fond of is, is journaling. So my, I mean, uh, I, at one time I had two journals going: one, an, a normal everyday life journal and a meditation journal. They have now uh, kind of um, combined into one, which I think is which which I think is fine. You know, if you're on a retreat, you can use your normal journal to work with. That. And I think journals are so important because, and um, I, I grew up in a in a pretty hardcore journaling tradition where you only used pen and paper. Uh, so you couldn't edit, <laughs> edit your experience or edit your present notions. And where you um, you swore a mighty oath, you would never, ever show your journal to anyone. So you were not performing. You were not trying to impress some you know, future uh, reader of it. So that would, be, that, that would be something that I would encourage. And in fact, it is encouraged in quite a, a number of um, what I would regard as secular uh, secular Buddhist retreats. But other, other than that, I think it, it is a, an interesting experience of being alone with others that um, I wouldn't meddle with too much more. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Vivian um, has her hand raised, so Vivian. Yeah, hello, um, I'm calling in from Sydney. Um, Winton, I was also at that school strike um, last Friday and I was at the Pitt Street Uniting Church beforehand and there were a lot of Pacific people there and a little service for the young students and a band. It was a, the church was absolutely full of people who were gathered there for, for their faith, you know, their religious faith. And a lot of something that impressed me in your book was that you said that Buddhism and I think Christianity and a lot of institutional religions sort of create a virtue out of being non-political and I that that rings a bell with me because you know this thing of being not political it is seemingly very virtuous to people I know and yet climate change and climate action is highly political and you have to learn how to do it properly and I thought the rally there they had um, they had some of those specific people people on stage they also had a trade unionist, they had Aboriginal people, and they tried to cover all the sectors of society that, that could appeal to the government, but it was still sort of cap in hand to the government, please recognise us, please listen to us, please. You know, it was sort of that feeling of, surely the government will realise that what we say is correct. And um, I'm wondering if there's a different way, you know, you say you're the secular Buddhist, um, idea is to break out of that that it's a care you know caring thing and I, I just wonder how to think about that because this virtue of non -politic, being non-political is very prevent, present among Buddhists and Christian people I know um, yes well, yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you mean you know that there's this sort of holier than thou attitude to people who are politically active um, and I, but if you're practicing the basic Dharma ethic of care, if you care, you know, and if you just the way it, um, it it takes form in the traditional practice of um, loving kindness meditation, for instance, um, then you can't uh, you can't refrain, you can't stand outside the political process. And um, uh, yeah, uh, interestingly, I went to, um, I, I was at, a, at a, a political meeting that had absolutely nothing whatever to do with Buddhism last night. And uh, it was just a, a small group of people who came to see a film about a very famous union, trade unionist here. And a number of the people in the audience uh, were actually members of my sangha, 
I had no idea where it had these sorts of uh, these sorts of interests. Um, and I, I found that a real shot in the arm. But by the way, I mean, about the, you know, the, the uh, rally on Friday, um, I didn't notice there was too much cap in hand going on. I thought some of the uh, some of the kids um, placards were very um, assertive in regard to the you know our rulers who are all uh, members of the carbon club and so they're not listening anyway and that's the problem. Hmm. Thanks, Vivian. Um, question. So I we are a little bit past the uh, the hour, so I think it's time for us to end this. But I want to thank um, everybody for coming out, and certainly want to thank Winton. For, um, thank you, Winton, being here with us. And if we can all give him a little round of applause or namaste, whatever you prefer. And um, it's a great discussion. Uh, it's a great book. Really encourage people to. To read it. So um, in Australia, have a good day. If you're in the United States, have a good night. <laughs> and um, maybe we'll do it again some other time.